Hi, this is Marta Kristen from Lost in Space, and you're listening to Retro TV Radio with host Pat McCormick. Greetings, fellow classic TV fans, and welcome to Retro TV Radio. I'm your host, Pat McCormack. On today's podcast, I am joined by my pal, the talented actor, Ken Oland. Ken's a great guy who is truly thankful for his many amazing experiences as a Hollywood heartthrob with a resume for miles. He considers his nickname Lucky Ken to be very accurate, as you'll hear in his great stories. As an actor, producer, and highly devoted family man, he is a powerhouse of positive information, as you'll hear. We discuss his illustrious career, having appeared in up to 60 TV shows, not to mention starring in a couple of classic films. We talk about working with his co-star Jennifer Aniston in the horror classic Leprechaun and Sir Patrick Stewart on Star Trek The Next Generation. But that just scratches the surface. Enjoy! Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the podcast, my good buddy, Ken Oland. Ken, how are you? I'm good, Pat. I'm good. It's always great to hear your voice. It really is. I appreciate that. You know, we got to know each other, oh, I guess it was, well, it was less than a year ago uh, at the Hollywood show. Right. And I remember my wife and I walking away from you. You were at your own table, and I just said, you know what? I just have this strange feeling I'm going to know that guy forever. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I tell, you know, it's funny. I, it's kind of a philosophy that I have. I, I, you know, told this to my kids and, and I really believe in it. That's, you know, you and me having lived, I'm you having lived that life, having made those decisions, have those experiences occur, you know, that it's just, it's that awareness and consciousness and experience that all kind of come together in that little sandwich called Pat and Cormac over there. And then there's this, you know, other version of the same kind of thing over here called Can Olad. And um, it, it really is that I don't, I don't feel, I feel there's just bad decisions. I feel that there's reasons for people to, to be separated by way of, and I create an identity it gets really deep here, but it just really just comes. I'm trying to keep it simple, but that really is the only difference. Is 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 kind of tracing back. Well, what happened to him, and what happened to her, and, and that's now they're making these decisions. Now they're identified as this, and that guy's a jerk. And you go, well, they are. But when we get down to it, like in acting, you have to you know really explore a character and find reasons for these decisions or what makes them up. No one's just born, you know one way or they are just one way it gives more dimension and that is also allows for for whatever is ability to forgive someone you know as well and that's challenging you know that's really hard to look past the that that those choices that person's making actions and and the persona they're becoming to forgive them oh it's hard for me i'm not saying i'm not a forgivable guy i'm just saying those situations go fly in the face of my philosophy at times <laughs> yeah well and and again i've met other celebrities i mean quite a few actually most of them are gracious like you um and then again there are some that you know you have that wall up that barrier and speaking of gracious folks i wanted to let you know this is my second interview with ken <laughs> Yeah, well, the thing was, we actually did one a, a few months back, and the file got corrupted, and I just could not tell you. I, we'd stayed in touch, too, and it's like, oh, my God, he's my buddy. How am I going to tell him? we got to do this again. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like a, we did a run-through, you know? It, yes, exactly. And again, you're gracious enough to say, let's fix it. Let's, let's do another one. <laughs> Ready. In acting, they say, shoot the rehearsal. And, you know, in this case, you know, we did, but sometimes, you know, it didn't work out, but the rehearsals are good, too. <laughs> right. No worries at all. So it's, it's You've been so wonderful with me, too, because we had this common love for guitar, and you're a master, and I am just, in, you know, impressed as hell with your skills as well as, as you know, the, the instrument itself and what I'm finding, you know, the inspiration through some people on YouTube that, you know, you've basically kind of turned me on to a lot of these um, little tricks and little things to get better at. Um, I just love it. I really, really love it. So um, there, there's our uh, 
our copacetic synchronicities going on here. Yeah, it's true. And and hey, you know, don't think I'm not getting some something out of it too. I mean, I'm feeding off your your energy of this new thing, this bright new shiny toy that is playing the guitar and the love of music that I mean, ultimately we'll get you to the point where you can paint your own pictures and you know, that's how I look at it. The guitar is a yeah. paint, it's a paintbrush and your job is to know the colors. <laughs> Truly. I mean, I, and it's so much to it, too. I mean, we could go on an hour on guitar. We really could because it's so much, like I'm learning theory, right? That's how I started was was signing on to a, a program. Um, what's his name? It's, oh gosh, Scott Paul Johansson. And he's got a wonderful online Patreon course where you just, you know, pay 11 bucks a month and and he has really well thought out lesson plan with, with homework and PDFs and so forth that walks you through these videos of play alongs and it's very very informative and that's you know one can just sit there and, and, and kind of bounce around on YouTube and here or Instagram and hey try this link this will help your guitar playing and that's great and you can get good but I to me that's kind of like you know not the best way to go. It's better to, to really look and learn theory, learn the fretboard, understand, you know, triads, perfect fifths, perfect fourths, diminished chords, understand what that discussion's all about. And then through the practicing of scales and, and con, you know, consistency, um, then, then comes the, you know, just the development, then becomes the ability to express a creative idea and know it. Yeah. Well, and I mean, it's easy to build a house, right? It, but <laughs> say you don't have a very good foundation. Uh, it is true. No, that's that's really what it comes down to. I'm sure. I was thinking acting, probably the same thing. Yeah, it's a, well, as we talked about in our first run through. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I didn't give you a copy of that, did I? <laughs> no. Yeah, I, you know, to be honest with you, since this, this is an interview and, and, you know, for information and just kind of introducing, you know, me to your viewers and so forth, um, I wouldn't consider myself like one of those quality or this, this level of trade or, uh, you know, on that level of acting. So I, I kind of fell into it purely by accident, you know, as, as I was in college at Art Center Pasadena and in around the sixth term and uh, I just wasn't interested in going to class i was so involved with with you know all the new age self-help you know um counter group stuff this was drawing me in because of the reality of the, the level of sincerity and honesty and and how people were relating and that is a, like a foray into acting you know acting is the art of human relationships and you know psychology i guess you would see would be the more the science of it you know but uh, acting really is you know, kind of happened because as the school said, Ken, you should spend some time elsewhere, you know, <laughs> you're not here. And then uh, I was meeting a friend at a restaurant. Her name was Maggie Rowan, and she was with a group of people. And, and I walked in. It was the Hamptons on Highland. And uh, I stood, they all stood to meet me, which made me look important. And it caught the attention of a, a talent agent named Harry Gold, who was there with his wife, Bonnie. And their children were Tracy and Missy and Brandy Gold, all on their own TV shows. Oh, yeah. Brand, right? Brandy was Baby Makes Five. Tracy, obviously, Growing Pains, and, and Missy had been. So, and Harry just formed his, his agency based around managing his kids, and they just kind of grew. And Harry and Bonnie said, hey, you know, who's that guy pointing to me thinking I was an actor? He's an actor. Who is he? And I guess I looked like something like that or somebody. And so the waitress who also I happened to know, you know, handed their business card to me. They had given it to her. And so I followed up on that. And that was like around, sept I want to say October, August, September-ish of that summer in 83. And um, the next thing you know, I'm going out on auditions. And I got like six callbacks to a soap opera called One Life to Live. And that's when Harry says, hold on a minute. You know, let's see what we have here. So he started sending me out on other auditions, and I ended up getting a sh uh, an episode of uh, I did get like a, a five and under, and on one of the soap operas. But then I got a, a small episode uh, episodic role on a show called Matt Houston, and I played 
Scotty, the, the streetwalker, <laughs> which, you know, overall in Canada, who I played hockey with, <laughs> like, hey, it's Scotty, Scotty, the streetwalker, he's here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and I got the role, I understand, primarily because I didn't play it affected. I didn't a- a- affect any kind of stereotypical role. I just played it very straight as a runaway kid who's having, he's doing things to stay alive. And um, that was what got me the role, that it was, it was easy enough that from that standpoint. And I attribute that to my involvement in those other programs because I... I open my eyes to how, you know, to, to people's experience in life and, and so on, and to very listen for, for things like that. So that just started to happen. And then the next thing you know, um, I'm testing for a movie called Red Dawn. Right. Yeah. That just, you know, I went from Mads Houston to a few, you know, maybe a, a commercial here that or two, and then, and then you know, bang, I'm, I'm actually testing for Red Dawn. And that came through a series of, of, of steps because Barbara Poldovan, who was the casting director for the Bad Houston, st- Aaron Spelling stuff, her ex-husband was was the head of casting for MGM. And he, you know, I got to know him. He brought me in, coached me, and I just went up the ranks. The next thing you know, Freddie Fields believed in me and and he put me in front of Milius and, and I didn't get the role, but I got a test option next to Patrick Swayze and, uh, Charlie Sheen was there and, and a few others. And it was really, really the amazing opportunity, you know, to just now this whole thing from kick out of school. to And I did some advertising in the meantime. I worked for a guy, probably I should say, as an account executive for a small ad agency company, you know, but that was short lived. And then next thing you know, I'm, I'm working and I just hit the ground running and it was just, you know, one thing after another. So I never really struggled as an actor, and I, I just didn't. I'm saying, you know, and I didn't ever uh, until now. Like, if I wanted to go out for stuff now, it'd be hard, really hard to get the role, right? Because it's it's a different game all together, completely. And once you get going, you're on a list. Like, I was on, remember George Clooney got his SAG card on uh, a Riptide, which was my first TV series. Right. And very first day of shooting. Seriously, the first day of shooting, I'm in a parking lot as a parking lot attendant, and 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 it's a little out of order of the show. But there's Clooney, you know, he's a, he's a he is a a five and under line on this one. He's a small line. He looks and he goes series regular. <laughs> I said what? He goes yeah, series regular. <laughs> <laughs> and we just became buddies at that point on, and and. Uh, and I, I understood what he meant because he'd been around the block. You know, he goes, "Yeah, this is your end, but this is good." So it was a it was a good run, and uh, and then it pretty much came to a point to where uh, you get on a list, you're getting shows, and uh, my resume just grew. You know, episodic, a couple features, and see, you know, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Wow. Well. That's great. I mean, gifted foresight from George Clooney. I mean, that's <laughs> that's a good telltale right there. <laughs> yeah, he go, he calls me later when we were. Um, I was on Riptide at this point, right? And he's and he's on Tracks of Life now. And he calls me. This is before I'm getting married, and this is like probably a year after, two years after. He just got no. I think he's on Tracks of Life then. And he goes, Canada. I said we were in the best place, man. I go, why is that? He goes, because we haven't hit yet. I mean, look at Hasselhoff, and David Hasselhoff was on Night Rider. And that was coming to an end. But then, like, I think a year later, he got Baywatch. Not only did he get Baywatch, he bought Baywatch. Yeah. He ran Baywatch. Mm-hmm. He was the owner of it. <laughs> it was like, yeah, George, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that has a lot. did pretty good for himself. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. Well, you know, you've established that you're a multifaceted guy. I mean, just in the short conversation we've had so far, um, but, you know, as an actor, and I've asked okay. this question of a lot of the celebrities that I've talked to so far, I generally get the same answer, um, but I want to put it to you. There's the, there's the genres, you know, comedy, drama, action, um, westerns, uh, you know, there's, there's plenty. I want, I'm not going to list them all. Horror, comedy, dramatic. Horror, right. The genres about family. There's cr- there's plenty of genres, but but a lot of them fall into the same genre, right? right? Right. Yeah. So, okay, just in the genres department, because I I'm I'm curious about you know what your experience with the mediums are, but in the genres, what what was your favorite? Well, so 
I, I turned I tended to get hired, I guess I would say, um in the drama category, mm-hmm. right? And I really wasn't in comedy because if you look at the the resume there it just pretty much shows action and adventure shows along with, that may have some comedy in them, you know. But my favorite was really having fun with the comedy when I would get an opportunity. And I and I I can I count it on my hand. That's how sad. You know, <laughs> because having this very fortunate, lucky run as an actor, I only got a chance to do, I think, about two or three comedic roles and one two of them were on one show that was renegade that played um this guy who's often he's a uh, he's he's incarcerated he's a criminal you know for small petty crimes and so forth and he's off of his meds and he gets out he breaks out of jail and he you know commandeers a cop car and he's just now you know super manic and uh that was fun you know that that kind of role was so i had so much fun on that show that they brought me back for another role where I played a ghost. A guy died and he's coming back. And so there's this, you know, kind of comedic quality to the character. But those guys would later hire me to be on a show, an episode of, I think it was 18 Wheels of Justice, because they needed some levity on the set, they said. This is the, the main cast here is getting a little too serious. And that's common, by the way. It's very common for an, a young actor or a new a newbie to get a great break and be on a show, and suddenly they become extremely nervous and they become sort of full of themselves, and they become, <clears throat> I guess, difficult. You'd say to production, not for, not production friendly. It's such an unknown. You know, this whole thing is so subjective. So you, you gotta. So they, I, they call me into kind of you know I do the Jim Carrey bit on set. You know, it's the prick had my. I joke, Jim, Jim had my career, damn it. But it's kind of true. We looked a lot, we look similar, but he's, he's a genius and I'm just more of an upstart. But he, he was, he was, uh, that's the fun on a set is to just keep everybody laughing and have a good time when it's appropriate, obviously. When it's not, you know, you don't pull that stuff. But I would say, you know, honestly, Pat, most of the stuff I would have preferred to do more comedy. But I ended up getting hired as easy to the, you know, the hero or the guy you least suspected was the villain. Right. So anyone Jump Street or something like that where you're the date rapist and no one expects you to be that guy. Right. Well, I can easily see you doing Jim Carrey. I just wanted to say that. Um, And you're right in line with what a lot of the other folks have said, which is there's nothing better than making an audience laugh. True. And... Of course, with you, it was it was films. You know, the bulk of my career was really television. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I I had three, I would say three films that were, you know, of anything recognizable: Leprechaun, Summer School, and uh, and April Fool's Day. Which again, talk about luck. They're all seasonal type movies. One was franchisable. But really, they, they'll always be played. There's always going to be an April Fool's Day screening of the movie. There's always going to be a leprechaun during St. Patty's Day and, and horror films and festivals. Summer School is like Porky's. It's an iconic movie with Carl Reiner. And you know it has a great cast that later went on. But just those three, really... I did a comedic role for a movie called TNT, where I was brought in to, again, to, you know, to be uh, you know, a goofball. But but most of, most of the stuff was really from television episodics and T in the series that I had. Well, it's got to make you feel good that I considered you a movie star <laughs> before a TV star. <laughs> a movie star. Series regular movie star. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> it's not that I'm uneducated about Ken. It's just how I see him, folks. You know, yeah. just look at this guy. You're going to tell me that's not a movie star, but whatever. Uh, well, you know, that's that's subject to interpretation. But the real reality is, I, th- I guess what qualifies it is if you've been in a, in a movie, but if you've been in and you've had a starring role a, or ensemble starring role in a movie that gets that gets screened in theaters, that I think is what really 
If it shows in theaters in, on, a, on a bona fide run, not just, you know, hey, we'll screen the movie in some small theater so we don't have to pay residuals to all the actors, <laughs> you know, you know when it, if it screens on television. It's, if it's a second run on TV, then that's a different pay scale. And that's what a lot of people do. But, in you know, at least they did in the old days. Now, you know, it's who knows? It's so many screeners. But bona fide, to be a bona fide movie star, I think you got to be in a movie that's in theaters. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I would agree. Um, but again, between, say, feature films and television, was there stage work thrown in? No. There, see, that's what I'm saying. Right? I really, I kind of, it's a unique situation. And I, you'd have to just say, Ken is one of the luckiest dudes in the world. And actually, I do. That's my handle, Lucky Ken. Because it's, um, I didn't do any stage work. Uh, although stage work did inspire me has always inspired me. We have a, a place in Montana on Flathead Lake that my parents, my grandparents bought, you know, many, 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 many years ago. And, and um, it's now my brothers and mine. And but we would go there every summer and there was a big fork summer playhouse that we'd all make sure we go to see a few plays. And it, it would only, and that during when I was a kid, that was always the most fun. I just, I would hang out with the actors afterwards. And it was, it was magical to me. The theater is, is really, a, it's like a, a, an amazingly, just a, a wonderful creative space of, 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 of magic and, and, um, you know, it's in fantasy. And more so than, than you know, when you look at television and, and feature film production, it's so much more like a like a manufacturing thing, right? Because you're working with cameras and sets and schedules and departments and locations and vans to get you from here to there and, and you know, weather and all these, all these outside factors that have really very little to do with the performance itself. There are a tremendous need and support for it all to come together, but really... When you're on a stage and even the smallest amount of, of props, a delivery, a performance can just hold you spellbound with a light on a, on a person. It doesn't need much. And that's the magic to me of the stage. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, you're still lucky, Ken. Yep. Still lucky, Ken. <laughs> I got, no, uh, not, not from this standpoint. I mean, definitely fortunate from the actor, but my luck is that I've, my true for good fortune is I have five incredible, you know, they have, they're not children, they're adults now. Yes. And my wife, my wife and I've been together for 38 years and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really, that's, that to me is the mark of, of, of real great fortune with these guys. I'll be honest, Ken, when you yeah. said lucky Ken, that's the first thing that popped into my mind. Yeah. Was your family, which is yeah, so it's... impressive and, uh, just goes to show what great people you and your wife are, um, um, my son, my youngest son, Cameron, who's a pre-med at, 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 in San Diego, UC San Diego, uh, his, he's outgoing, I don't know where he gets that from. Anyway, he, <laughs> he, he, um, he actually has, has just been taken under the wing and, and, and really supported well, uh, by the head of, of the, uh, ultrasound department at the school there in the hospital. And he is. Cameron was giving lectures to two to second year med school students, and he's an undergrad. He's graduating this year. He was and not only that, but he's been published now, and it's on my Facebook page. He's a paper that's going that's going to be used as an educational reference for the hospitals, and as and he did that. It was Cameron's paper and 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 findings. <laughs> like man, that's amazing to me. That kind of that's to be lucky to have that kind of person in my life as well as the other four you know they're also unique also said that accomplished anyways that's that's kind of cool huh uh yeah i'd say so and again you just can get to know you it doesn't surprise me because you, you've got that you've got that uh, positivity that intellect and you know it does get passed on i mean i have a close friends same deal at, at usc film school i mean he's a prodigy and it's just like, oh my God! I hope I can borrow money from him later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Remember me? <laughs> hey, close. <laughs> can I get a job? <laughs> yeah. You know, speaking of the show business industry, you, yeah, you were the actor. You over sixty TV shows. Holy smokes! You know, yeah. and again, but the thing that I was not 
educated, uh, at least I don't feel like I was, enough on was the fact that you became a producer. Yeah. So that's, that was a, um, another wonderful uh, happenstance. I um, See, this is around, uh, I want to say it was 90. So 92, my last TV series was Super Force, which is a, a Robocop for kids. And, and that was in Florida. We came back from that. And that was where things weren't. I don't know. It was the, the Gulf War had happened and a lot of action shows went away. You know, the, the live action stuff was kind of, you know, 35 millimeters kind of thing. It just was gone. It was all now, you know, video and it was all shot on video, as they say, and, and was reality show based stuff. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, my wife and I lived in Acton at the time and we, we had some land and horses and I bought a feed store. <laughs> Anyways, and uh a job did come along where um this this independent film i'd never done an independent film i didn't know what that whole world was all about and so i read for the role uh, of a movie called digital man and uh, it's one of those shows where you run around with you know football gear spray painted silver so it looks like you're a sci-fi warrior you know it's a chest plate from a cashier or some shit and then the, the shoulder pads <laughs> and hockey shin pads I don't, it's just what's funky stuff you have a headset and a gas gun and then much of your lines are tracking tracking i lost my lost it. <laughs> that kind of stuff and uh and so i had such fun and, and we had a good time i got to know the director really well as you know and he was phil roth and um not not the other Phil Roth. This is Philip Roth. Anyways, he the, the small little company made this movie, and and Phil had this um had this script this business plan called UFO, Unified Film Organization, because Phil was kind of really pretty pretty genius in this kind of stuff. He was making sci fi action films for really low money, but pulling off really big quality of action and 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 so forth, and using some hard effects. Um, so this was at the beginning of the digital age happening in terms of that animation. Right at that time, you still had, you know, big Deep Space Nine and you had all the big Star Trek, which was pushing the big query computer systems. That was still, that was happening. But on a, on any other level, it was really out of reach for most people. Those packages hadn't come down yet for, you know, for the independent level. So Phil had this plan and I was sitting next to my neighbor in Montana. You know, you know he's like a father figure to me. And he asked me what I'm doing. And I showed him the script and uh, the, the business plan. And he came back and he says, call me in for a hundred beans. And I said, oh my God, hundred to a hundred thousand dollars, Pat. And that, <sighs> that, you nuts. That's... <laughs> Lose every dime, and I don't. You go. I believe my old pal. I had no idea how much money this had. Anyway, so wow, you know, because he was always like the guy I always wanted to be like. He had five kids. He was an attorney. I just, I just loved his family ethics and the way his life. His kids were they're like my brothers and sisters, and um, and that's what started UFO. And so that began producing. So our first movie was was. Um, our first movie was Dark Drive. If you change, if you, the viewers want to look that up has an eerie resemblance to the matrix i won't say anything other than the fact that joel silver did come into our booth <laughs> did this for 45 minutes at the afm ask us about what we're doing did happen about nine months later see an announcement and in you know we had four hundred thousand, and he had like you know 88 million so whatever i don't know you know i talked to Chandler later because i played hockey with him and i remember saying you know <laughs> First, Jim Carrey, now you. It was a movie. So that was our first, you know, uh, first film out of, that, out of the box for that company. And uh, it was just filmed myself and an animator and an editor slash animator. And and we made that movie. Um, and then we grew and made more movies. And then to, to, to a point to where we were we were doing three, three films a year. And then we sold the company to, you know, everyone's your partner at that level. Like if you're, uh, um, if you sell license licensing, if you license the rights of your movie to say a, a German entity, you know, a distributor, they, and you buy enough of your movies, they buy it a dance, right? And you used to be able to bank those contracts to make your movie. So you get all your, your agreements from all these various distributors from all over the various territories. You go to the bank and you sit down and you say, here's my, you know, budget. Here's the pre-sales on those films, on that film, you know, what the bank will gap the difference at a fee and then you can make your movie. You become the little studio. You don't need anyone to say yes. You have the power of yes. It's pretty amazing. And that's another stroke of luck. 
So again, this is the brainchild of Phil Roth, not mine. He, he, he really had this whole plan. So we ended up making those films and selling the company. I got out. He stayed on. He and the other partner, Jeff Beach, continued. They refactured a new company called Bufo, Bulgarian <laughs> Unified Film Organization. It's in Bulgaria doing all kinds of big films for Sci-Fi Channel and so forth. And I, I didn't want to be missing out on the family. I mean, I was not. It wasn't working for me to to be a producer at that level, making these films. I would miss out on baseball games, barbecues, family events. And I just, at that point, had to say, you know, that's it. I'm out. I'll figure something else out. Yeah. Well, and, and good for you. I mean, as a parent, I know. I know exactly where you're coming from. Um, yeah. It's funny because, you know, we all went through hard times you know, not long after. I mean, that was a rough, rough period for me. Really rough. And I'll be very honest about it because no pretensions. I have no image to, purport, to support other than the honest one, which is I did not know what to do. It was really, you know, I'm a, I'm a producer with no no script, no money and five kids and a burn rate. <laughs> and, and it's just unbelievable, you know, what to do. What do I do? And that's they, you know, Tony Robbins says your greatest problem is your greatest, you know, solution, and you'll find it's funny. <laughs> it's true. Not easy road to go. Sometimes we kick and scream along the way, but it's hard, no question. And I ended up bouncing around through various different kinds of places to get through it all. You know, we don't say to end up. I don't think you ever do end up, but you do get through to places to new new levels. And I'll say. I'm, you know, better for it. My kids are better for it, for sure. You know, they would not be who they are if I was still on that other path just because it, I was never around. And it would be too hard to need to run, you know, a family with five kids and a father who's, you know, yeah, it's absent. Wouldn't work. Right. Well, Again, I, I commend you for making the right decision. I know I've practiced the art of the pivot for the last oh, 10 years now, you know, just based on what my body's doing. You know, it's like, okay, you can't hear so well anymore. So no more of that electric guitar. Okay, uh, how's your speaking voice doing? Well, it's doing stuff that's weird. So shove a camera down my nose. I mean, all kinds of things that you've just got to explore, you know, get it get it right, uh, yeah. you know, uh, rule out all the positive possible horrific negatives and then pivot and adjust yeah yeah i i, I think it, i mean it's very true it's first of all i think it's internal i think a lot of it is is, is they say psychological but i think that i i, I equate that to being internal uh, in our quiet time in ourselves then you're more worthy of kind of things along these lines if we're still Whatever it is we're doing, it's causing these kinds of little you know, outs in our bodies and our in our in our lives. They do stem back to ourselves and our perceptions of ourselves. And are we giving ourselves the best opportunity here? We trying. So that's what I looked at. That's for me was that path. I'm happy that you turned out the way you did, and it sounds like you're on the right track. What you guys. It's funny. Last time we talked, you were headed to the gym. Now you guys work out together. Is this, is this a plan that you and your wife are on, or because we need tips, Ken? <laughs> well, so uh, my wife's a trainer. She's a personal trainer, and so um, and what I do now, I'm a I, I, I ride. I'm a motorcycle tour guide. I take people on on Harleys across the country. Yes, you know that's a seasonal gig. Um, that's just kind of where we found ourselves over these time, you know, keeping our family unit, the most important thing. And the kids are kind of spread out. So Janine works out regularly and I work out at home and I play hockey. It's Tuesdays and Thursdays if I can and skate, you know, open ice, not, not, you know, stick time. I, I will be signing up with some, some teams here at one point, but it's all t schedule. Been doing the autograph shows as of late, uh, which has been fun meeting people and, and doing that all goes toward the camera only at college fun, which is very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool coming up. And, um, cause I don't believe in student loans and I don't want her to have them. It's, you know, just we can avoid that altogether. And the other big bit of news or how I, you know, where life's come to at this point is, is my daughter Taylor is, uh, my oldest daughter is a creative force and we're working together making children's books. And, uh, she's moving deep into the, you know, the, uh, 
the energy healing and uh, she's actually a fantastic life coach she's coached me <laughs> i mean it's it's amazing to take so much sound advice from your kids you know but when you find one who really is wise and has this beautifully centered and loving approach to it all completely that advice is generally the best than anything else if it comes without any kind of attitude pain retribution and nothing it's just love and so tay is just a wonderful partner in this to be with so uh i'm at my background as i said in the art center was illustration it's now come full circle pat so my major was these was the advertising illustration was kind of a dead major if you will as computers kind of you know came in and the, they don't really need a wrist anymore for storyboards they do but after that, and even now, AI could probably pull off a lot of what, you know, you could use. So it's it's really uh, come back to now I'm finding a lot more fun and enjoyment in doing Procreate tutorials and, um, and and getting good at it, getting it all come back to hen in, this, in, in the color. So art is now my big thing, is, is getting into, um, I just love the Comic-Cons because these artists are so amazing to hang with and, and, and look at their stuff and talk that shop with. So that's the fun is this. We stay physically fit. We stay mentally, you know, we're LA sober and, and, and awake and uh, um, spiritually balanced uh, and still and, and focus on really do what you want. You know, how much I got, how many years left? Roughly, you know, let's say I'm on the back nine. Do I want to spend anything doing I don't want to do? No, I got to do everything that's got to be something that's right in line with those things I just stated. That's what's got to be my, how I spend my time. And we talked about money earlier about people having it. And, you know, the money doesn't really, it comes along when you need it. It's, it's It shouldn't be the thing that drives it because it, it really, you know, it'll, it'll show up, I think. When it shows up, it shows up, and you need it. It always does somehow. If, if unless you know, we, like like they say, life will work if you let it. Right, exactly. It's like my medication. They say the same thing about my medication. Let it work for you, man. <laughs> It'll work if you let it. Yeah, I know. She means my medication. Like, are you taking your your vitamins? I can hear it. And and now, Ken, drop and give me fifty. Yeah. Well, she's yeah, uh, she's a she's the drill sergeant, all right. But in a loving way, she's you know. She's like, look, it's here if you want it, man. If you want the information, you want me. But if you don't, I'm not going to have bug you about it, you know, which is even more even when they guilt you into it. But how great. Have a personal trainer as a wife and a life coach as a daughter. You you know, you are lucky, Ken. <laughs> go, listen, listen what I got. I got, this is me bragging now. I do have a physical trainer for a wife who looks outrageous and I still, she can still stand me. And I got, a, you know, a life coach and a daughter. I've got a physical therapist and a son. I've got a financial whiz and a commercial real estate genius in the middle son. I got a dancing choreographer. Madison creates from within, which is really, really rare in artists. They all usually create from representative. What you see, what you, you know, you're looking for inspiration and scrap and sort of things to build from she comes it just comes inside out from her and then there's Cameron who's going to be our physician we're going to have our medical cover <laughs> so it's like the old ants are in force now <laughs> i think you guys would be on the top of the list to like send to mars to start a new civilization new um, colony you'd have to have no, no of course would, there would have to be another family or some other uh opportunity for which to, that was the one thing that always kind of creeped me out about lost in space i mean it's like is it all about don is he the one is he the guy wait a minute he's the only only guy that could be the guy <laughs> yeah you know don it's true isn't it you look back at the dynamic of that show and it's yeah it's pretty innocent and pretty unthought out because if you look at today oh my god that would be a recipe for disaster <laughs> What's happening with Billy Mummy's character? You know, he's he's going to sabotage the whole thing in a fitter rage. And it's just going to be, I don't know, I just be really weird. Um, one thing I do want to plug is my son, Dr. Kyle Jordan. You can see him, Jordan's his middle name. He's a, he's a physical therapist. If any of you out there listening have um, aches and pains and you get like, you know, we all do it, or, or, you know, from injuries or from age, it's really important to find some low impact exercises and, and methods. And Kyle is just putting up beautiful stuff on it. Instagram that is so helpful for athletic and active people. And even if you're not, if you know, it's just good stuff. 
Really, really bad. Most people don't know what to do when it comes to going to the gym. Most people, the, the, if they don't have a trainer, then they just essentially kind of wing it and, and you know, go talk to friends. But I really recommend researching with physical therapists because then you're going to find out exactly, you know, the better part to get healthy and strong is really understanding from a therapeutic level. Well, uh, Ken, I, I mean, a lot of people are going to be listening to this and just go, what a great guy. And then the point is, you've had such an incredible career. We, we could, could talk, talk about, about that stuff for hours. Yeah. You know, all the all the shows that you've been on. The, I mean, working with Stephen Cannell. Cannell? 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 Oh, yeah. Stephen Cannell. Uh, yeah. I mean, these are there are a lot of instrumental people on that level that came into my life, or I came into theirs, if you will. Steve was the person who put me, um, you know, in on television at a series. It was his show, Riptide. It was his suggestion. Listen, this is not where you want to be. You know, you've done the season. You don't want to stick around here. You want to get out there and be doing films, feature films. Because at that time, guys like Michael Pere and others were happening, you know, editing the cruisers. And and this is really where I should have been moving to. So C was like saying, look, it's always here for you if you want it. But I, I as a friend, and I later was able to return the favor and help him out with the film. He was, he's, he funded the one to make and, and he was going to cast somebody. And I said, well, you don't want to use him. I think you want to use this guy here. I think it's Antonio Sabato Jr. I said, recommended. And, and that was better for him, you know, from a sales standpoint. Cause I, at that point I was doing, you know, film producing. And there's guys like Michael, like Michael Landon, who was truly an angel, an amazing person to be around, inspirational, creative, um, caring, loving, giving, funny, so many great things to say about Mike that was just, again, a lucky thing to be on a show that he turned it into a two-parter because he liked everything that was happening. And then when he came over, but he came under budget on his season. He gave it all, whatever was left to the to the crew. He split it among, amongst them evenly, which is, again, you don't, that just doesn't happen in, in, let alone in business, let alone in the film industry, right? And then you got guys like Carl Reiner, who probably bless his heart. You know, he's passed now. But to be, you know, it was really special to, to be on that set and, and be around, you know, Carl and Jeff Franklin, who wrote it, and all this c- comedic juice. These guys are so good, and, and he's an icon. And then you got Mark Harmon, and then this whole cast, Richard Horvitz, Dean Cameron, Patrick Laberto, Shawnee Smith, you know, uh, it's just all these, and Fiabiana, everyone has gone on to do great things from that show, you know? Same thing with, like, April Fool's Day. Uh, you had Deborah Foreman and Thomas Tom Wilson and Clayton Roller, I mean, you just look at the people. We had just started all of us at that point. We were just in our early stages of our careers. And these movies that we were in, you could see where things went from there. Presently, I'm writing the forward to this new book coming out called Guy Wants Me Gold. It needs me gold. <laughs> and it's about Leprechaun. And it's really, it's using Leprechaun at, at you know as the focal point and, and model for really about independent filmmaking and what and goes on. And um, he asked, the writer had asked if I would write the forward to it. And it's it's really, um, it's interesting because we, you know, we all seem to have found our gold, right? Jennifer. <laughs> Both you and, and Miss Aniston were great in that film. So yeah. she's, I mean, funny smart you know we all age and go through life and she's always stayed pretty pretty consistent with you know herself her sense of self and her ability to you know she loves people and she's out there right in the scenes it was really fun to work with her she's terribly sexy attractive you know when we're on that show it's just man you know it was easy for our characters to be you know in googling each other and and and, and having this kind of affair because we're flirting with each other on this in the show the characters are flirting so that was really nice to have and it was genuine and she was just so fun and beautiful. Um, Mark Holton, again, super funny guy, just brought all the comedy to, to you know, around for everybody. He's it's, it's just so good, so good at it, right? And um, but again, Jennifer did really, really well. She went on to obviously she's a major star and producer too. Yeah, well, and it's great to hear that she she likes people. And again. Yeah. No, I, I never heard anything bad about her. No, know? me either, as a matter of fact. Um, yeah. We do have a mutual friend. But um, when you did this trade show, this Pasadena Comic-Con 
Yeah. I'm curious. Now, when we met, I was well, we were walking through the Hollywood show, and I I saw. Wait, I know him. And then, of course, I looked down because you know you're, there's a lot of stars there. It's like, okay, play some, play some, play some. Um, and, and there was that shot with you on on uh, Star Trek: The Next Generation, and it was like, I, oh my God, it's Ken Olanth. Yes, yeah. And he's standing there by himself. Here's my chance. <laughs> <laughs> when they come up to you, or not like you're sitting there taking a tally, but what what are you most recognized for? I mean, when when you come to these things, and I'm sure it, it's random, but well, what, what I okay specifically, you look at what's probably held you know the highest level of, of viewership, and, uh, and the two things would be Star Trek: The Next Generation and Summer School, and and Leprechaun. I, I'd say those those three things really were kind of like I mean, everybody. They still place those movies, Star Trek's obviously in syndications around the world constantly, and there's a huge, huge as you know, you know following of uh, star trek stuff so um yeah, pr- predominantly star trek the next generation and summer school are right uh, you know there because there are two really memorable characters one is it wasn't like i was a you know uh i was a captain's a digitally altered bastard son and so that puts you kind of in a in a spot of you no know, okay they'll remember that you know, it turns out I'm not his son, but for a moment there, the audience thought, geez, Picard actually has a kid, as a son. And um, did I blow it? <laughs> Anyways, so that, I think, is a, is a big uh, draw. And the other one was this stripper in summer school because, you know, again, why is he sleeping all the time? And, then, and that's a bit of a standout when you get to do a full-on strip scene. And, and it's funny, you know, that the, the payoffs for that movie, for the character particularly, right? Yeah. Is big. It's stronger than a lot of the other stuff. Because Dean had so Dean was really the star for all the kids. Sandpoint was Dean's vehicle, and 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 you know he's every he's he's so much he's doing this that's that's rich and full and funny. So much of it you couldn't really you could probably pick on a few things that really struck out you. Mine was pretty singular. Like that guy's always sleeping. What's what's the story? And then boom, oh, I see why. All right. So it was very clear stripping. <laughs> 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 yes. but, you know, but, but you know, be honest with you, those, I'd, I'd only done like oh, I think one other show really, which was the Chiller. I they, I did one of those things where they, you know you fly out and do a Chiller in New Jersey, and really had a blast. It was fun to, to you know see old friends as well as this one was as well, right? But uh, at that time, there you know there was just a different kind of setup. Those are that's a horror genre right hollywood show i guess covered more than more pop culture i guess if you will or a lot of things the horror killer was really geared towards horror so you see a lot of those people that you'd known um and that's what i hadn't really done these this is the the first one since that time and um i did another one shortly after you know like a couple weeks ago which was uh where was the, this was in in Pasadena at Comic Con? Right. It was really, again, y- y- you go there and you sit at a table. It's kind of like a drug deal, you know. You, you take your pictures, <laughs> get paid. You know, it's funny, it, but it's it's really endearing because it's it's a chance to connect with people who have watched something you've been in, as you have watched it too, right after you've done it, and then there's this commonality of. Of, of of sharing experience about it, which is kind of cool, you know. And you get to talk, to, and and then you get to share more something they wouldn't know, they'd love to know about it, and that's really fun. I, I enjoy that part talking to people. Um, and then you know, from that level, so this one was kind of cool. We got a chance to be together, Dean, Patrick, and and Richard from Summer School. All but the, the four of us were at all in one little, you know, one table area together. Now, obviously, it's Comic Con, so you're not going to get any time from Rich. He's he's constantly signing autographs. People are coming through because he's a voice actor, right? And he's got he's got such a following in all these voice in these commercials and cartoons and stuff, animation stuff he's doing. So we were the we, we were the sideshow to, to Rich. <laughs> Never, never the sideshow, but I, I do understand that you know levels yeah. of, levels of popularity based on whatever it is you're doing, and whatever you're working on, and whatever's trending, and all of the other factors that r- fall into place. It's just like 
you know, everything is as it is. And your job is to just enjoy it as best you can. You know, it's true. And I will say, because one thing leads to another, it really, really does. That's a that's something to always remember. I, I, it, It's never, it's like Tom Petty and Duran Duran have the keys to life. Tom Petty says, nothing that I worry about happened anyway. And yeah, right, and and Duran Duran's songs, one thing leads to another. That's the method. All that's to me the method of progress. Remember, nothing is you're thinking and worrying about is ever going to happen the way you're thinking and worrying about. It just doesn't. You don't have a crystal ball. You're not that good. It's just unless you really, really try it. Even then, even then, you can't control it. So stop that. Secondly, one thing leads to another. Meaning, well, stay awake. Just watch what happens. And here's another example. Because of that meeting, that going to that second show, um, I've, I've met some agents and or people that would go on to rep me, and now I'm getting offers to go to other shows. And unfortunately, I can't do them because um, I'm, in, I'm already – it's a conflict with my, my touring job. You know, I, I, that's right now what I, I've committed to do, and so I do that. But if the show is available, I'll go. But what I really want to do is the Star Trek conventions. Well, that makes perfect sense. And I, yeah, and I think it's time. I, you know, I, re- and I look forward to that because for a variety of reasons, but predominantly because it was just, it, it was a wonderful experience to be, to work with Patrick. And, um, yeah, it's just it, to be part of history. That's a, that's another part of history, you know. A good exa- here's another one Gunsmoke, the remake. I, back in when my wife and I were first getting, first been married. I think two years in our marriage in uh, 85, I did a, uh, a gun smoke. It was the first remake of that show, uh, the series. They, they brought back James Ernest, you know, and Amanda Blake, Buck Taylor, and they made, you know, other characters, obviously, uh, Earl Holloman from Police Woman. They, these, I don't know if anybody will remember these people, but they were all instrumental in the, in the television show, which is iconic. I mean, this defines America. Yeah. So Gunsmoke made a first movie of the week. And again, Lucky Ken, I get cast with a really good role as a cavalry officer. And I'm there with James Arness getting yelled at by him, shooting it. We're all of it. I mean, it's on a horse in full regalia in Canada in the mountains. Doesn't get much better, really. Your first day, you ride a horse and you ride up to camera and you say to your horse, well, boy, he's out here somewhere. We're going to find him. And then you ride on and it's starting to snow. <laughs> it's just like, man, I'm in heaven. It's pretty amazing. So yeah. So that, that set up with, with, you know, came about because Vince McAvity, who was a director from Simon and Simon episodes, brought me in for that movie it's again it's again luck just good good fortune being really really you know looked upon nicely and regarded and bam the opportunity shows up patty i'd say this one okay so my daughter taylor uh one of her friends had given her tickets to go to an emmy to i think it's an emmys an emmy sh- um the present present yeah emmy show and she goes dad uh, you can't make it will you come with me and i saw that he's yeah let's go together so I went, and it was so fun to be looking around the room at a lot of people that I'd worked with in the past. And I come, I'm standing here with Taylor all in her demo suit, and she's dressed up beautifully. And we're going to go. And I see Gerald Mac, you know, McCraney, you know, Mackie. And I walk over and go, Gerald, you know, Mac, do you remember me? He goes, Of course I remember you. And he grabs me by the head and puts me in a headlock. We were doing this pounding on you <laughs> with Jameson. This is the Summon and Simon episode. And it was like, Wow, so. It's just so touching to to have to re, to just remember and relive the moments of closeness with these people the years past. You know that those we were doing that on a set about twenty five thirty years ago, and Tony Longo was bouncing my head on a pole table. I mean, it was just these great moments of being with these people working on these shows and now you get a chance to just reconnect briefly and, and it's all the same it's just like it was same thing with you know, carl reiner was being acknowledged at, at the, the american the director's academy i heard about it and i heard that george was the guest speaker and i i told the guy um chatfield david chatfield his mother rocky was putting it on i said i gotta go 
because my son Kyle asked me if you saw George, would he say hey to you? And I said yes, and he didn't believe me. So I so I wanted to first pay my respects to Carl and thank him so much for putting me in summer school because it made. It, it, it's a long story, but bottom line is, is it, that's the that's the porkies for a lot of NHL hockey players who are my heroes. So I got to be connected to them deeper because of this movie, which really is big for me. But so I, and 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 it was I, just to thank him. And then it, and then as the show's come to an end, Clooney's walking off the stage, and I tug him on the on the uh, leg, and I go, "Your aid." He looks down, and he goes. Kenny, <laughs> he comes out, gives me a big hug, and I said, I need some, po- I need some props here, some pictures. So he taught, takes some pictures, and says, I'll send you these pictures, Pat. I'll send them to you. And he says to me, do you remember when we went, he, and he was recalling a time, I was thinking the same thing, when we went to go get a motorcycle that he had purchased, we were picking up in Riverside. And I drove out with him, and he, brought, he rode the bike back. And there he was, this beaming, this big smile, riding this old Harley. And it was fun. We had a good time. Please, please. Please do send those because I'd love to see it. Especially, sure. you know, I'm, I'm guessing at some point you probably said, "Yeah, <laughs> series regular." <laughs> yeah. Well, but again, the, the most important part isn't isn't you know the connection to the movie side of the, of the aspect. The fact that these people are still my friends, still who they are. Aside whether I'm a plumber, whether he's a plumber, what does it doesn't matter. Whatever we're doing now, it's I'm an artist now on a motorcycle. You know, George is probably retired. Who knows? But we, it's it's really that love of of the growth of experience that we all went through, and we all went to different paths and some hit heights unimaginable. You know, incredible. People, others we lost along the way. You know. Yeah. Well, folks, you can obviously hear the gratitude in Ken's voice, and it's obvious why your friends stay friends for so long. I mean, your energy is just, it's its so positive, and I, I appreciate you, man. Um, before we go, did, did you want to give a plug to the motorcycle tours? Yeah, I do. If, if anybody out there is a motorcycle, has a motorcycle license and, and has the time and, and, the, and the wherewithal to join us on our guided tours, uh, the company's called Eagle Rider. It's Eagle Rider Guided to Eagle Rider. Uh, EagleRider.com, uh, but it's a uh, guided tour division. What you're looking for, I'll be leading about six tours this year uh, two Route 66s, the Wild West. They're really, really fun. Um, it's about two weeks, these are two week tours. They start in one city, end in another. All you need is your your lunch money, your uh, your dinner money, you know, trash your alcohol. Uh, and we provide pretty much everything else. We'll give you a jacket, we we'll get them helmets to lend you, motorcycles provided. Check the site out, look it up and see if it's something you want to do uh, and see if you can find a tour that I'm leading. I'd love to have you. It's going to be so much fun. Well, and obviously, folks, it'd be worth it just to hear Ken tell these stories. (laughs) Yeah, Ah, that's right. I'll just do the chase vehicle so I can hear the stories. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, it's it's uh, I know it's a life, huh? It's a life. Very lucky. Very lucky. Very, very lucky. Well, that's beautiful. Hey. Thanks, Thanks again, again for joining, joining me, me again, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> lucky I, Ken. That's what I'm going to call you from now on. And I'm Lucky Pat to know Lucky Ken. So, <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, anytime, Pat. You know, or Todd, it's, not a, it's anything I can do to support you, support small business and, in any way, shape, or form. It's, we need our lifeblood in this country, and our, we need to really think, rethink our, our associations to corporate entities and look where we can to support small entre- you know, business entrepreneurs and visionaries who have, you know, have an idea before they sell it out. <laughs> Let's stick to the small business. Let's see what we can do. Yes. Well, there's the most positive note I could ever dream of leaving this on. So we're going to do just that. Thank you, Ken. I appreciate it. My pleasure, Pat. My pleasure, always. There you have it. Another retro TV radio in the books. Be sure to check out Ken's Eagle Rider guided tours and follow him at Ken Oland on Instagram. Watch for him to appear at selected autograph shows and fan events, too. He played Picard's bastard son, for cripes sakes. So come on, Las Vegas Star Trek convention. Get this man on board. Also, watch for the new book, I Need Me Gold, on the making of Leprechaun. Ken wrote the foreword, and pre-orders are happening most fittingly on St. Patrick's Day. As you heard, we also discussed his amazing family, and you'll find links to keep up with them and all their endeavors also included in my description. 
If you haven't already, please subscribe to this podcast and leave me a positive rating and review. You can also find me on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram at Golden Rage of TV and on Twitter at Golden Rage of TV One. This is Pat McCormick, and thanks for listening to Retro TV Radio. doing now it's i'm an artist now on a motorcycle you know george is probably retired who knows but we, it's it's really that love of of the growth of experience that we all went through and we all went to different paths and some hit heights unimaginable you know incredible People, others we lost along the way you know yeah well folks you can obviously hear the gratitude in ken's voice and it's obvious why your friends stay friends for so long i mean your energy is just it's it's so positive and i i appreciate you man um before we go did, did you want to give a plug to the motorcycle tours yeah i do if, if anybody out there is a motorcycle has a motorcycle license and and has the time and, and that and the wherewithal to join us on our guided tours uh the company's called eagle rider it's eagle rider guided to eagle rider uh, EagleRider.com, uh, but it's a uh, guided tour division. What you're looking for, I'll be leading about six tours this year uh, two Route 66s, the Wild West. They're really, really fun. Um, it's about two weeks, these are two week tours. You start in one city, end in another. All you need is your your lunch money, your uh, your dinner money, you know, trash your alcohol. Uh, and we provide pretty much everything else. We'll give you a jacket, we'll get helmets to lend you, motorcycles provided. Check the site out, look it up and see if it's something you want to do uh, and see if you can find a tour that I'm leading. I'd love to have you. It's going to be so much fun. Well, and it, obviously, folks, it'd be worth it just to hear Ken tell these stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. I'll just do the chase vehicle so I can hear the stories. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, I know it's a life, huh? It's a life. Very lucky. I'm very lucky. Very, uh, very lucky. Well, that's beautiful. Hey, Thanks, Thanks again, again for joining me, me again, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> lucky Ken. That's what I'm going to call you from now on. And I'm Lucky Pat to know Lucky Ken. So, <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, anytime, Pat. You know, it's, not a, it's anything I can do to support you, support small business and in any way, shape, or form. It's, we need our lifeblood in this country, and our, we need to really think, rethink our, our associations to corporate entities and look where we can to support small entre- you know, business entrepreneurs and in- visionaries who have, you know, have an idea before they sell it out. <laughs> Let's stick to the small business. Let's see what we can do. Yes. Well, there's the most positive note I could ever dream of leaving this on. So we're going to do just that. Thank you, Ken. I appreciate it. My pleasure, Pat. My pleasure, always. There you have it. Another retro TV radio in the books. Be sure to check out Ken's Eagle Rider guided tours and follow him at Ken Oland on Instagram. Watch for him to appear at selected autograph shows and fan events, too. He played Picard's bastard son, for cripes sakes, so come on, Las Vegas Star Trek convention, get this man on board. Also, watch for the new book, I Need Me Gold, on the making of Leprechaun. Ken wrote the foreword, and pre-orders are happening most fittingly on St. Patrick's Day. As you heard, we also discussed his amazing family, and you'll find links to keep up with them and all their endeavors also included in my description. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this podcast and leave me a positive rating and review. You can also find me on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram at Golden Rage of TV and on Twitter at Golden Rage of TV One. This is Pat McCormick, and thanks for listening to Retro TV Radio. Retro TV Radio.